questioning is perhaps the greatest gift we have as human beings. Science is more than a body of knowledge. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking that teaches us to question everything we think we know. Science came about by developing techniques, methodologies for gaining reliable knowledge about the world. We have at our fingertips the technologies that were only possible for the largest governments and corporations 20 years ago as an individual today. If the human civilization continued at anything remotely like the current pace of technology advancement for a million years, where would we be? I think we're either extinct or on a lot of planets. The good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. We hold the scientific method in high regard because it works. If it stopped working, we'd throw it out. Discover the past. Create the future. This, this, this is the Here and How Podcast. Welcome to the Here and How Podcast, where every week we dive deep into big ideas to explore the past and create a brighter future. This is episode 21, Where's the Missing Link? I'm Stephen Woodford, also known as Rationality Rules, and with me is the tremendous Thomas Westbrook, also known Hello. as Holy Kool-Aid, and the radiant Rachel Oates. Say hi, guys. <laughs> Hi guys! <laughs> the famous hello. <laughs> do you do it in other podcasts? Uh, I don't know that I do. It it must become you a thing. Stop. Yeah, like this should just be a thing. Hello, yeah, just, hello. <laughs> right. So, see, I just I just want to say, um, yesterday was Fourth of July. Sorry about the tea, um, <laughs> but the fr- freedom tastes delicious. Well, you know, I prefer that you be my slave, but, you know, (laughs) (laughs) pay your damn taxes. So, um, Rachel, Thomas, where is the missing link between humans and chimps? Uh, The crocodile. Uh, (laughs) Um, Please, go on. Um, You know, we've never observed a half crocodile, half duck, therefore, checkmate atheists. Essentially. Um, have you ever? That sounds legit to me. Yeah, I don't think you can convince me of anything else, Steve. I think we should just end this episode here. Probably just end our positions entirely, right? The thing yeah. about the crocodile is that it's a mix between two arbitrarily chosen animals that don't necessarily mm-hmm. have a common ancestor, so a duck and a crocodile. Whereas well, at least when it comes back far enough, right? Yeah, but if you go back far enough, it's like it looks like neither of them essentially. Um, yeah. Whereas when you look it's at human, not like. The assertion is that we have a close in ancestor with chimps, so it, it it's a slightly different claim. And uh, but where is where is the missing link? Where is the midway point? Lucy. Well, I... Lucy. Oh, ah. Lucy. Oh, I've seen Lucy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that... she's beautiful, isn't she? I mean, I, she is. I wouldn't have it's sex with her. Really but... impressive. <laughs> Oh, harsh. I know. Poor girl. I know. I know. Poor girl, indeed. She's just a little She's bit. She's a little bony, little hairy, uh, <laughs> but she is. She is beautiful. What a find, Lucy. But have you guys ever had that claim put to you by creationists, for example, that there's the missing link? We haven't found it. Yeah, I just the way I see it is that there's no like one missing link. Everything is so gradual. We're never going to find like every member of every generation. Mm. It's just not possible. Well, so, that's well, rather than a missing link that's like a hybrid, like a half half one thing, half another. It's more of a gradient, a, a very yeah. slow, gradual transition. Mm-hmm. And I, I instead look for like fossils. Every fossil is a transitional fossil. Right now, if yeah. you died and were fossilized, you would be a part of the lineage of the transition between past generations and future generations. Yeah, and. Unless you have every single generation, then there's always going to be some missing fossil. There's always going to be some missing transitional fossil. But the fact is that we do have millions and millions of fossils. I want to say mm-hmm. that the Natural History Museum in uh, London alone, I think it's in London, mm-hmm. has like it's like 9 million or 7 million, some astronomically ridiculously huge number of fossils. Uh, but what about so- fossils between human and chimps? Between humans and chimps? Or perhaps more accurately, human and chimps, um, uh, common ancestor. Do you know how many many fossils we have of that? How many fossils? Mm -hmm. Or how many individuals we found? I don't know the total number for individuals. I know that there's there's a number of different transitional species, you know? Yeah. You know, you've you've got the, the Neanderthals, you've got the you know, um, Australopithecus afarensis, you've Mm -hmm. got, you know, and they're, they're, they branch, they have different branches and stuff, but 
I don't know the total number. Well, of fossils. From what I'm researching at the moment, there's maybe maybe up to about five thousand, ten thousand in in between that region. It's okay. it's hard to find the fossils, but there's there's plenty of full individuals that we found that do fit the uh, bill of being a transitional fossil, the missing link, as it were. The thing is, is that if you have humans and you have um, a common ancestor between humans and chimps and you find something in between, somebody can say, oh, well, now you have two missing links either side of that. And yeah. you can find another missing link and they can go, well, now you have six because there's two either side of that. Etc. Etc. This is the game that's played. It's kind of moving the goalpost. Um, but like the way I see it is that if like we were sort of like studying history and we found a document from like mm-hmm. 1910 and another from 1912, people wouldn't say, "Oh, well, 1911 must not have existed then." <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, you wouldn't do that. No. So they, just... why do people do it? <sighs> it's a yeah. it's a good uh, there's a good analogy there. I like it. Um, so, so to move on and to put it, the emphasis on us, Homo sapiens, um, what's unique about us? What characteristics would we look for in, in a transitional form? What do we have that other apes don't have? We have bigger bums, don't we? Big bums. Yeah, we have Big bums. giant asses. Like, um, Speak for yourself. No, we do, good sir. Our gluteus <laughs> maximus is fucking huge. We are the Kim Kardashian of the apes. <laughs> Didn't we make these exact same jokes like two weeks yes. ago? We did, but it, it's so true. I've spent um, longer than I'd like to admit looking at different ape butts over the last uh, 24 hours to make sure that that claim oh, is, that is how solid. You that's how I just it to your girlfriend. Yeah, that's how I justified <laughs> it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I'm but, yeah. only on Kim K's Instagram for research. Steve, exactly. Steve's, inter- Steve's oh. internet search is like gigantic ape butts. <laughs> <laughs> incognito incognito is the answer doesn't come up anymore <laughs> but yeah we we have giant butts what else do we have um we're bipedal yes we're bipedal that is our that's feet, rare. like slightly different as well like our feet aren't as clingy and our toes are different right yep we have like our toe doesn't our big toe doesn't function like all other apes a thumb yep and we have we precision have grip on our in our foot. hands yep mm-hmm. um we we have no tail Yes, mm-hmm. that's a good one. I didn't have that. Which I mean, down. I guess, yeah. I guess the great apes would wouldn't, but the yeah, like if you go back to monkeys, that's true. Uh, Bigger um, brains. We're less big, hairy. Big brains, bingo. That is that is a primary. Big brains is a huge, huge factor. A chimpanzee who who, relatively speaking, has a very big brain, has uh, one of up to I believe it's four hundred cc, whereas the human on average, is about 1,180. So, uh, CC being cubic centimetres. Another thing also is... Also, certain yeah. regions of the brain. Yes, okay. yeah, yeah. So, prefrontal cortex, for example, that is huge in, in Homo sapiens, and uh, we can't really tell with humans in general because the fossils don't really preserve tissue of that nature. But um, other apes don't as, have that well part of the like brain anywhere near as big. Having more mirror neurons. Mm, yeah but again we can only really compare that with the apes but that i guess that is the question another another thing is that we're hairless uh with exception to on our head we have very little hair everywhere and we sweat and sweating is more rarer than you think it's found in plenty yeah, dogs of dogs don't do it no they don't so they t- uh, they get their tongue out right they have always panting mm-hmm. and it's because that's they pant, the way they yeah. cool down it's a similar technique to what elephants do the reason elephants have big ears is because they can pump the blood into their ear where there's a thin layer oh. of skin and it allows it to cool down and go back into the body which is pretty damn fascinating speaking of elephants they also are hairless so pretty fascinating and you get really the, yeah and you get this with uh well not hairless, if you know what I mean, but then we're not hairless, but we're considered oh, hairless right, okay, in the greater yeah. context. Okay. And the same so if sh- an elephant mm. pumps blood into its ears in order to cool off, then when it's like a really hot day, are elephant ears like, are they like a giant boner on like either side of its head? <laughs> like a dried up pretzel. It's got like these ears that just like puff up. I don't know. It might. Well, no, because like on a hot day, you're like arms and legs and body doesn't go really stiff with blood because mm. like to cool you down um like the the little capillaries and stuff near the surface like they 
have more blood pump into them, right? To kind of like cool you down and like it, it's, it's it's like a thing. Um, but our arms don't go stiff just because there's more blood there. Yeah. So that that was a terrible explanation. I was but, really hoping that yeah. elephants got boner ears when it got hot out. You know, ultimately, Ooh. I don't know. So I don't know the exact mechanism. I imagine it's it is similar to humans, where it's to do with hormone yeah. regulation and you know the distribution of certain things that we have. It gets all complicated. But it's a pretty. I imagine it'll just be like when our cheeks get flushed and we go a little bit red. Maybe elephants like their ears get a little bit yeah. redder. Oh, that would be so cute, little pink eared mm. elephants. <laughs> well, we have Sorry. you know we have reactions when we get hot. You know we sweat. Um, we do try and get to areas where it's not so hot. We flap about whatever mm. it might be mm. and similar. Like right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it is hot in the UK, which means cold for uh, America. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, we get stuffy heat though. So, next question, though. Uh, which of those characteristics do you think evolved first? You may already know the answer. I do appreciate that. Wasn't it the bigger brain? Okay, so we got big... Wasn't that kind of like the Kickstarter? Or, like, how far back are we it. going? Yep. You were saying, Thomas? Uh, didn't didn't the, the ability to stand on all fours... So, okay. To, like, run, run longer distances, to stand up to oh. see mm. predators... Okay, so I thought that that, that evolved, and then like we kind of came down from the trees, and or maybe that came after we came down from the trees. I forget the exact order. Well, this question's been something that's interested people basically f since the finds of Neanderthalensis, which is one of the first human um, ancestors to be found. Although technically not quite an ancestor, they are to some of us though. But we'll get to that in a second. Well, I say in a second, mm -hmm. in 20, 30 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. For the longest time, people insisted that it must have been the brain that developed because that's the cornerstone of what we are. You know, we are so special because we have this brain. Um, but evidently it wasn't. Um, we walked on two legs first and then the brain size mm -hmm. followed quite a bit afterwards. And by, by, by quite a bit, I do mean a lot. It took a long time for the brain to catch up. As resources became scarce. Yeah we had to relocate more often and a bigger brain would have then helped us to figure out the conditions and opportunities that each new location gave us. So the walking and the scarcity of food and the, the, the necessity to be able to move from one area to another came far before the, the brain increasing. But what about things like height? Cause aren't we a lot taller than our ancestors um, in general? Yeah, we're pretty tall, but like considerably, not considerably. So height? No. Yes and no. It depends on the ancestor. So when it comes to okay. human height, one factor that needs to be always at the forefront is nutrition. So there's mm -hmm. been an enormous increase in height with Asians over the last like two generations. That's got nothing to do with evolution. It's to do with nutrition. So if you if you're fed well when you're young, if you get those nutrients, the body can afford to put the um express itself as it wants to by making you taller so food is really important if you want to get to your potential height of course it's too late when you're older if i was fed a bit better when i was younger i may be a bit taller but <laughs> that's just the way it works <laughs> <laughs> um but no a homo sapien it's, it's something like an average of about six foot for males uh, maybe six one and about five eight five seven for females which is mm. this we, it's very easy for us to look at Homo sapiens and say that there's a lot of sexual dimorphism, which is basically the term for um, differences between male and female. But that's because we are human, and so we see those differences very easily, when really there's actually not that much. We're quite close. Whereas if you go to other species of apes, some of them have less, to be fair, but some of them have a lot more difference between males and females, specifically with size, you know, 40% or more yeah. we, we can look at. In human, it tends to be about 15%. So have you guys ever heard of Piltdown Man? Yes. yes. What, 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 I mean, to me, that is one of the most atrocious acts of science I've ever heard. Like an absolutely pitiful, um, mm -hmm. really unfortunate, chapter in british history so for anyone that needs a recap or hasn't heard of it um piltdown man was a paleoanthropological hoax by a name called charles dawson um and what he did is looking at how exactly humans evolved he was one of the proponents saying it must have been the brain that was big first and then the other factors came later and he faked it 
He just full on faked it. And it took 41 years for him to be revealed as a fraud. That's really sad. It, to me, that Why that is did it take so long? Like, did he just fake it well or were people not looking? There was political factors involved. And one, people just didn't have access to it. You'd have to go out of your way to get access to not many people were into uh, paleoanthropology. And three, we had the the amazing find from Germany, which was Neanderthalensis, and Britain was just falling behind. And so the British wanted, it was like a confirmation bias, they wanted to be able to find something that we could call British, and it's more important than Neanderthalensis. And we found it in Britain, and for whatever reason, 41 years, that's older than all of us. It's See, I, I read something that was saying that... that some of the experts in the field and some of the paleontologists were skeptical initially. They, yeah, they were. And it, it, yeah. and it was that skepticism that eventually led to the experts in the field taking this fossil and comparing it with all of the other fossils that we had and realizing that it stood out, that something was wrong with it, and that, that and eventually further analysis revealed that it was a hoax. So there was skeptics, you're, you're completely right, and it was hard to get access to the fossils because they were considered incredibly rare, and some people did get access and said that they're fake, but not, not too many people listened. The real nail in the coffin, as it were, was subsequent discoveries, and the discoveries showed that, they, that there was a contradiction, because it showed that walking upright came before the size of the skull, and that's when people really started going hang on something's really not adding up here this is we need to take another look but here's a really cool fact that i didn't know um perhaps you did know i don't know but this this kind of protects us from this kind of fraudery in the future you can now download free 3d printable files off pretty much any fossil that's been processed and um what that means is that anybody can get access to a 3d print off any fossil and that might sound like it's not enough. You need access to the fossil itself, but you actually don't because one of the ways they could tell that the uh, that Charles Dawson faked Piltdown Man is that there was evidence of the teeth being grinded down with a file. You could see that on a 3D print. Um, yeah. And there was, there was other variables as well. But I just think it's absolutely fascinating that's that, really that cool. you can download 3D printable files. That's, that's, that's brilliant. That's a huge step forward. That's really cool. Yeah. Talk about access to information, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. So, basically, in this episode, what I want to do is go through many of the discoveries we've made, primarily through the fossil record. Um, but before I do so, how well do you guys know this topic at large? Not hugely, off the mm -hmm. top of my head. Better than Kentovend, but not as well as Richard Dawkins. <laughs> <laughs> If only we could have Richard Dawkins here, he would uh, he would put me to shame. It would be fantastic. But the reason I bring that up is that it's possible that you guys know many facts about the species that I'm about to talk about, or subspecies, perhaps it's more accurate to say. And if you do, then interrupt me, throw them in, because it's 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 a fascinating topic. And I, I'm i going to spend a lot more time, even after this episode, looking into it, because there is so many unanswered questions and so many answered questions that bring so much valuable knowledge to the table. But before I do so, I want to quickly just break down the evolution of life as a whole. Don't worry, I'm not going to take everyone's time for too long. <laughs> so the Earth formed 4.5 billion years ago. The earliest signs of water are dated to 4.4 billion years. Single-celled life, or unicellular life, show up about 4.3 billion years, so all really quickly. Eukaryotes, which are cells with a nucleus, show up at 2.1 billion years, so that took ages. Multicellular life shows up at 1.5 billion years. Animals at 590 million. Vertebrates at 505, tetrapods, which are animals with four limbs, at 395, amniotes, which are animals that lay eggs on land, 340, synapsids, which are proto mammals, fascinating species by the way. If you want something to delve into, look up look up synapsids; they are fantastic. Uh, 308 million. Do you guys know when mammals first evolved? Um. <clears throat> So you've got synapsids, which are basically proto-mammals, 308 million. I'm going to so, guess about 65 million years. Alrighty. I'm going to say about 200. Alright, Thomas gets this one. They evolved about 220 million years ago. 
Ah, um, okay. the, I, that was way too late. <laughs> <laughs> then we've got mammals that give birth to live young. That was about 160 million years ago. Placental mammals, about 125. Oh. So, Wait, what did they do before then? Uh, eggs. You had like a you had like a oh. mix. You had like a mixed area as well where where mm. you get this with snakes. You've got snake species. Some give birth to eggs, and some give birth to eggs but keep them within the body. That's kind of like a midway. Mm. And there's a, there's a connection between the evolution of how that gets to giving birth to live young. Pretty. Well, and then you have like you have really marsupials cool. too that have yeah. like these weird processes. Oh, yeah. You have like the the platypus that lays eggs but is otherwise a, a mammal. Yeah, the he uh, the platypus is great. It's just like I'm a mammal, but fuck the rules. I'm doing what I want. <laughs> so we have supra primates, which turn up about 120 million years ago. Primates, 75 million years ago. Uh, what about great apes? When do you reckon great apes emerged? That, that... 60 million years ago. 60. Okay. 50. 50. All right. Well, Rachel gets this one. It's 15. Yes. Haven't been around oh. for long at all. Oh, and wow, then you've okay. got hominids, which is between ten and four million. So we are we are so young in the grand scheme of things, like yeah. really young. It, it's it's almost embarrassing. But yet, look at what we've accomplished. It's fantastic. Would hominids include all homos? It includes all homos. Yeah, hominids. Like not not homos is in like, <laughs> like not that kind. Know. No, no, no. Ho- homo uh, homo is in like Homo sapien Homo. It, yeah, Genesis, oh and the Rectus. Austro, yeah, and the Australopithecines as well. It would include those okay. as well. I believe I've got the right term for it. There was several. If I have got the wrong one, just let us know in the comments. And well, I can't fix it during this conversation. I will, I will, le- I will highlight that comment. Um, now before we move on to, f- basically, what I want to do is take us from hominids all the way down to Homo sapiens. But before we do that, if I was to tell you that a chimpanzee brain is between 300 and 500 cubic centimeters. Uh, what size do you think the average human is? I've already told you. I want to know if you can remember it. And do you think there's a difference? 400. 400. You reckon we've got less than yes. a chimp? <laughs> oh, wait. What? Wait, what? A chimp has between 300 and 500 cubic centimeters oh. of, of um, cranial capacity. What do you think humans have? I did say it earlier, so you might know it. I thought you said 400 earlier. No. I'm going to let Rachel guess first. Yes. Uh, but 600. So I think I remember you saying over 1,000 something, 1,200. Yeah, Tom, Thomas gets this one. It's, it's about oh. 1,180 on average. Uh, do you think there's a difference in male and female brain size? Oh, I know this. Mm-hmm. Kind of. Ish. So I read... Um, a paper once that suggested that males have a larger brain volume, but women have a larger brain surface area. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So, which is why some people think that men are more like logical and women can be more emotional because, you know, it affects how different areas of the brain work and stuff like that. And that it was mm. it went into a lot more detail. I'm kind of oversimplifying a lot, but it was an interesting little paper. That's awesome. Well, I mean. Yeah, go, go on, Isn't the, the, the evolution of complex thought and and being able to, you know, to, to do kind of deep level analyses, isn't a large part of that due to surface area and due to, because like, it's, it's not just like the size of the brain. Mm-hmm. It's that, you know, you have all of these different, like the brain folds in on itself. You have all the different sulci mm-hmm. and gyri and whatnot that, you know, different thoughts are happening on them. I'm, Probably uh, there's some neuroscientist right now that's just rolling their eyes, but... Well, you know, we know that different segments of the brain do different things, and there's arguments that's been put forward to say that size actually isn't the be-all and end-all, because, for example, they've looked at chess players, and they've tried to see how big their brain is. It turns out it's smaller, and the reason for this, Mm. so far as they can tell, is to do with... Uh, neuro neuro connections being able to communicate more succinctly more uh, f- in a faster processing way um so if you were saying making the fallacious statement that big means brainy <laughs> um although that might be a bad term to use then there may be factors in it 
all of those questions fall into you know neuroscience and i don't know nearly enough on the topic about it but there is a difference uh, male the male average of a homo sapien is 1260 cc and female is 1130 i was going to ask do you think that that fact at all plays into the 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 fact that males tend to dominate females when it comes to topics of philosophy and science or do you think it's more to do with culture where women have been basically thrown aside not even uh, taught how to read in some cultures um I was, I'm, I'm wondering what do you reckon that plays a role and if so how much i think it i think the cultural thing has played a role in the past mm. maybe because of the slight like neurological difference to begin with um but now i think i don't know it's tough i i do think that there are biological reasons behind like gender differences where there are gender differences and stuff like that mm. but um like if you look at things like in, in sort of like 20 something year olds now um women outperform men in like so many years of education yep. and even though they're outnumbered in like maths and science and stuff like that the women who do go into it tend to outperform men in general do they i didn't know that yeah i knew that i knew that they and, perform better and they do work better at mm -hmm. university etc there might yeah. be something so to be like said even, about development even if you look if you look at like pay gaps and stuff like that everyone goes on about how women earn less than men and stuff like that no in the something like um 25 to whatever um women earn more than men if they're graduates from uni yeah so yeah i think as culture is changing then the sort of biological differences are becoming less noticeable i guess i, I don't know it's a tough yeah. one it's really complicated there are, there are significantly more men in stem fields Mm -hmm. depending yeah. on depending on where you are so like if you're in silicon valley especially there there do tend to be a lot like it, it is kind of a male dominated field computer science and engineering and whatnot um and i think in academia it's a little bit less prominent but um i, I could be wrong on that but i, I don't think it's an either or I, I think that yeah there are biological differences that mm -hmm. you know maybe lead uh women to be more attracted to certain fields on average but there's also cultural cultural elements at play for sure now nah, fair enough i just wanted to get your opinion on it because it's a potentially well it is a a volatile topic because it, it falls into the same purview mm. of race and iq because if there's sexual differences well what's to say there's not racial differences which i guess that's a divergence I... yeah go on yeah, I think that's definitely like a cultural thing in mm. terms of how many women go into certain fields. Because like, I I was quite lucky, and that in my school, um, there were quite a few of us in my year who like performed very very well for how crappy my school was. Um, and so, out of kind of like us and like the top kind of performing in terms of marks and stuff, like three of us were girls, and we just absolutely like dominated the guys in like science and maths and everything um and then i also happened to do well in like english and stuff as well mm. um and as i went to a levels i did more of like creative stuff than sciencey stuff but the point is i never felt held back by my gender it was just kind of like growing up i was like oh girls are good at science because the ones i was surrounded with were good at science you know and then when i got to uni and i was like hang on a minute there's not many girls doing computer science or engineering or stuff like that and i was like oh maybe this is like a cultural thing in other places then mm. and it was only kind of then i started to think about it which i know sounds really like naive but when you grow up just around yeah, well, why would you think about it right it's just yeah. a norm to you yeah no that's that's yeah. that totally makes sense to me i think there's a factor in women develop quicker than men physically and i just suspect there's something to, to be said about the brain as well um that's just conjecture on my point. I haven't looked into it at all. But there's really good reasons, for example, to increase the voting age to 25. And a mm -hmm. lot of them, for me, are very compelling. The mind hasn't developed sufficiently until around that age. This 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 number of 18 is largely arbitrary. And so maybe you, when it comes to school... Do you guys have a large voting turnout below 
25 cuz for us we did you know, for Brexit most the, the younger population doesn't really vote in high numbers the, well this is the thing that we find more and more the people that vote that are under the age of 25 tend to be heavily influenced by those around them yeah. to 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 quite a bad degree and then we have evidence that the brain isn't completely developed until the age of 25 uh, putting the cap at 18 or 16 is completely arbitrary so there's i think there's good reasons kind, good... kind of yes mm. but at the same time i feel like at 18 most people do go out and like you know they they get their own houses they live mm. alone they become independent a lot of them start paying taxes and stuff like that and i feel like if you're going to be influenced by the system and living as part of the system you deserve a right to vote on that system even well, especially if, if... You if know. you're able to then go off and enlist in the military and fight yeah. and die for your country, yeah. but you can't actually cast a vote, that doesn't exactly seem a, no um, seem like a fair yeah. trade off if see... you're paying taxes and whatnot too. Yeah, they're very good points you raised there. Mm -hmm. I, I see, I see problems with them, um, mm. but perhaps this might not be the best time to delve into them. <laughs> but that could be a, a very good topic to discuss at some mm. point. Uh, one yeah. that I'm not completely. I don't have a complete conviction on. It's just I'm seeing a lot of evidence for putting it to 25, and it it is I tough. Right? It. I don't think there's ever going to be a perfect system. No. But at the same time, you can't say, "Oh, well, let's um, start having IQ tests and emotional intelligence oh, yeah, tests yeah, yeah, before yeah, yeah. you're allowed to vote." That, like, that's a that no. Kind of seems like the next step to me, and I'm like, "Well, yeah, yeah, you know." I see. I see that fear of a slippery slope. That should not happen yeah. at all. That's that a they're... terrible, terrible mistake. Mm -hmm. I do think that there should be some level of mandatory education, though, in order to be a, you know, functioning civil, mm. you know. Well, we already have it. So I if, mean, if, I, you're, I if we, your we class have... is mentally retarded, or whatever term they use mm. at the moment, you can't vote. It's, well, it depends on the country, I guess, but you can't. So there is a level of in education. UK, you... I don't know if in the States, I don't know. Mm. Because... I really haven't looked into that. Yeah. No, it's, huh. It is a very fascinating subject with so many angles that we can approach it from. But um, Australopithecus afarensis, or Australopithecus, I should say, afarensis. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Lucy earlier on, Thomas. This is Lucy. It was discovered yep. by oh. Donald Johnson in 1974 in Ethiopia. But some fossils were found earlier during the 1930s that have since been incorporated into the taxon. So that kind of sucks for the person that found the knee beforehand and just didn't really know what it was. <laughs> and then, you know, 50 years later, somebody digs up a, a more full specimen. It's just like, holy shit, you don't realize what you found. You found an incredible fossil. L Lucy's probably the most famous fossil ever found, and she deserves to be. It's just insane. Do you know why it's called Lucy? I don't, actually. Do you know, Thomas? Uh no idea. They were listening to a song by the Beatles called Lucy. <laughs> ah. So they just called it after that. Oh, so this, this specimen is represented by fossils from over 300 individuals from Ethiopia. Um, uh, tan uh, I can't pronounce that one. Tan Tanzania. Is that right? Tanzania, yeah. Thank you very much. And Kenya. So they found them in many locations, and there's over 300 individuals that they have representations of, some of which are very... Uh, you've got most of the body, especially if you consider if you can overlap it by, okay, we've found one leg, so we can infer that the other leg would have been like it. Lucy's a great example of that. Lucy is a really, really good find. Um, I don't know all about the dating methods, but on all of the species I'm going to talk about, or subspecies, there's about six techniques that they use, and five on many of them, but six for the ones where there is enough to be able to look at DNA evidence. And there's quite a few on that. But Lucy, or I should say um, Australopithecus afarensis, dates to 3.85 and 2.95 million years ago. Males were 4 foot 11 and weighed 42 kilos, and females were 3 foot 5 and weighed 29 kilos. So were they a chimp? That's kind of the first question people will ask. <laughs> um, no, they weren't. They were as different to chimps as, as we are to chimps, uh, or as we are to them, sorry, I should say. So while their arms were longer than their legs, they had many adaptions for bipedal locomotion. This includes placement of the foramen magnum, which is the name that we give to the slot at the bottom of our skull, you know, where the, where the spine fits into. Mm. Theirs was um, upright. 
the presence of neck muscles unique to bipedal can, humans. They had. Can an... I can I elaborate on that just a tiny bit? Absolutely, go ahead. So the the hole in the the back of the skull, like if if you compare, say, a human skull versus one of the, you know the great apes that mm. is um, quadrupedal or walks around on say on gorilla four, yeah. four limbs or something. Then you can tell, like the the hole in the back of the skull is it's offset, it's it's placed differently. And so, what we would look for in a transitional fossil is something in between the two, where you start to see the shift take place. Where, you know, when you're on all fours, you know, you, you don't want the hole to be where it is with humans, where you know it's made to sit upright on your skeleton to look mm. around. You want it to be in a, a position so that you can easily walk on all fours and, and navigate around and whatnot. And yeah. With these intermediate species, you see the Ferenda magnum shifting mm -hmm. between the two locations to be closer to where it is with humans. Yeah. So it's it's a pretty pretty obvious. It's it's one of the obvious indicators of a transitional skull. Mm. To, to add on that, I remember when I was younger and I heard, for example, people would find a skull of a human species and they would then say that we know that it walked upright. And I remember as a kid thinking, how the hell do they know that? Mm -hmm. Well, mm. it goes back to what you were just saying. There's very good inferences that can be made based on things that are completely removed from it, you would think, without actually knowing the details. So the skull, for example, there there is many clues in there that can tell you all about the form of locomotion that the species used. Um, if you find a kneecap, just a kneecap, you can find out substantial amount because of the angle in which each part, each segment fits. Um you can off depend on how much you've got on like your shin you can see which parts are stronger which indicates where the weight was being put and how it was being put and you can see that um that structure follows the same density as homo sapiens but doesn't to chimps and there's just there's a lot more that can be seen than on the surface by somebody that doesn't really know what they're looking for that's that's why people can find a tooth and identify a species out of it. It seems bizarre, but when you look at the evidence, there is a really good reason why why that's done. Um, I find it so it's, amazing. It's like if 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 you're just a regular person looking at a bone, it doesn't look like anything special to you. Yeah. But if you're an osteologist who's spent mm -hmm. twenty yeah. years of your life examining all the different bones of all the different species in a particular field, they're looking at you know bone density. How is it? You yeah. know the how is all the material you know arranged what are the different you know angles of different things like they they're they're taking so much into account so when they get an entire hip joint or something then with you know some uh, just a little bit of analysis experts can be pretty certain as to you know how how did it stand how was it positioned what type of animal was this you know you can gather a lot of information from it exactly and then you combine that with like dating methods and other things and stuff and you can learn a lot more mm. i can understand the incredulity of looking at something and going i do not i do not understand how they've ascertained that much information this has to be bullshit but when you do look at it and you do look at the objective evidence that you can do yourself it is you will be convinced. It's it's fascinating. But with that said, I've deliberately left out species where we only know of them from like a two for a single skull. I've only kept the species in which we know very, very um, well that they existed and we have many individuals. So we have the, the skull and the uh, placement of the foramen magnum. We have the presence of neck muscles unique to bipedal humans. Now, a lot of people would say, well, surely no muscles were preserved, but muscles have a specific thing that they do to bones they leave remnants of where they was so if you look at the if you look at a dog um fossil you will find that it has a lot of indications of muscle around its neck whereas you might not find that on a on a homo sapien because there is not that kind of level of muscle uh, they had an s-shaped spine which acts as a suspension that is a that is a telltale of bipedalism um, especially in primates they had angled knees that that, that were showing that she was walking upright she had no divergent big toe that's something unique to us she had fixed arches in her feet and uh, in their feet i should say because we found many and they had very wide pelvises in comparison to, to say chimps and the reason being for that could be for giving birth and also because of bipedal locomotion in general it helps to have a wider pelvis just because of the way in which we move and the way in which it um, uses the energy rather than letting it expend so incredible stuff and something i wanted to say about bipedalism 
They've put chimps on machines to calculate how many calories they burn when trying to walk across just just ground. So not using their normal arboreal locomotion of going through trees, but using just be it bipedal or or, or quad, quadrupedal. They wanted to know how much energy they burn. Um, they burn over forty percent more calories than than a human, and it, that's how effective our walking is very very good with the balance and everything of retaining mm. as much momentum as possible which is why when we run we leave the floor rather than mm. be stagnant so they weren't no- knuckle walkers either so a lot of people think that we evolved from knuckle walking um a knuckle walking common as- common ancestor but evidently that evolved after our split from other apes which i didn't know before Ooh. yeah the, uh, That's interesting. Lucy's cranial capacity was between 375 and 530 cc. So uh, yeah. again, the males are bigger than the females. But if you remember how big chimps are, it's not much bigger. But what's wonderful mm-hmm. there is that there is a lot of evolution. In fact, almost to the point that it's it's undeniable that she walked upright, and that mm-hmm. that is an incredible find that basically tells us we were walking upright before our brains got bigger. So. It's, it's really hard to to be able to emphasize just how important that find is. It's just incredible. Imagine imagine being that person to find it. <laughs> Unbelievable. What one of the like things that makes me angriest on the internet is there's a video of a woman who um she's at a museum and I think she stood by like um the sort of display of Lucy and she's going on about like oh it's just a stupid monkey this isn't evidence for anything oh they're just lying to us this is stupid it's just mm-hmm. a monkey and I'm like well no if you took the time to like read all the information that's there you'd understand all this stuff and yeah. how it's not just a monkey mm. yeah just, I, I love oh, it it's like me. yeah in 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 your expert opinion <laughs> yeah from your your homeschooled mm-hmm. creationist textbook that you know exactly and then they, they come out there and they take kind of one surface glance at it and they assume that because they can't really glean anything from it that nobody else can. And it's like, yeah. no, like there are people literally spending their entire lives studying the bone differences between <laughs> different types of primates. Do you know what really pisses yeah. me off? It's that kind of individual that will say to somebody who's being patient and taking the time and humility to investigate these fossils, to look at them objectively. It's that kind of individual that will say to them, you need to be humble and just believe that the universe is entirely created with you in mind. I mean, (laughs) it it drives me nuts, but that is essentially the message that tends to be given. But um, next to Lucy, uh, she may have bumped into Australopithecus africanus. So this specimen was discovered by Raymond Dar in 1924. It dates between 3.3 and 2.1 million years. And so they lived at the same time as Afarensis. Also, that's a long time. They lived over a million years. They're represented by several hundred uh, fossil specimens, and all of them are found in South Africa. Same is true of Lucy, by the way, uh, of um, Australopithecus Afarensis, all found in Africa, which is why they say we're all Africans. Um, they marked, this is important, they marked the first ape, Sorry, the first time the word ape, which is Pithecus, was formally assigned to any hominin, which in effect formally declared humans as descended from apes. So big find and big formal implications. Mm -hmm. Their cranial capacity was 485 cc. So getting slightly bigger, but but not hugely, but it is bigger. And they had the same sexual dimorphism as Afarensis, but they were slightly bigger as a whole. So were these guys a chimp? (laughs) No. (laughs) <laughs> if you look at the skull, and I, I I advise everyone that hasn't to look up the skull of Australopithecus africanus, it's incredible. It, if you want to see a transitional fossil, look at it. It's, it is but it is so much in between a human and what you would conceive as basically a chimp. It's unbelievable. And I'm I'm using the word chimp. We didn't descend from chimps, but the common ancestor that we share is more chimp like than human. So that's why I'm using that mm-hmm. time. But you should totally look it up. It's it's amazing. Um, it did have longer, sorry, while it had longer arms than its legs, so it's still ape-like, uh, chimp-like in that sense, it had rudimentary homo sapien adaptions, uh, that, um, afarensis didn't. So we can see it as a transition moving forward again. Um, really important extinction, extinction I want, uh, 
ex oh, losing my words here. A really important point I want to make about both of these is that we find no Homo sapiens found in the same layers at all. Which means that we didn't we didn't Ooh. exist back then, but these guys did. Mm -hmm. So that's a very easy way that you yeah. could destroy evolution in general. If we found a Homo sapien mm -hmm. that was buried, say, during the dinosaurs, during those <laughs> those areas, that would throw a serious serious problem. I was going to say a free, serious rock, in, uh, rock into the machine, but it should be serious. Uh, so what mm. about all these completely legit commenters I get on my videos who say, but we found humans living at the same time as dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to check each claim at a time, but oh, <laughs> I imagine I imagine it would, it would be time I wouldn't get back, put it that way. <laughs> well, a lot of times it comes from from things like they'll say oh we found a footprint inside of like a dinosaur footprint fossil mm. and it's like yeah because you can't have you know different layers of you know sedimentation that fossilize on top of other layers you know so you have a an open you know dinosaur footprint exposed and then years later or something there's yeah weathering I don't know exactly. Well, 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 this is it. You could just have weathering, and you could have a herd of mm -hmm. um, animals go over it in, in order to traverse from one location to another, and in the process, just turn up the land by you know several yeah. feet, maybe, and then you just have a human walk across, and you will necessarily have basically you know, at the same layer. But the layers aren't just to do with how deep it goes. The layers are to do with so many dating methods. Um, as we've discussed before, that it's not just we see a layer and we go, right, we're going to call that layer the Miocene. It doesn't work like that. It's it's based on objective evidence. It's like, we don't know what that is. Let's test it and find out what layer that belongs to kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, for me personally, Afarensis and Africanus prove to me sufficiently that we are definitely evolved from a common ancestor from chimps. Is the same true of you guys or would you need more evidence? Um, I think if I didn't know about other things, then it would be a good starting point, but I'd still maybe want to see something a little bit between us and them. Yeah, that's fair play. That's fair play. I mean, yeah. we won't even touch DNA that much, but mm -hmm. that's that's, uh, that's a great one. So moving on, we have Australopithecus uh, sedibia discovered by an eight-year-old called Matthew Berger in 2008. Aww. So a relatively new finding. Amazing finding as well. It dates to two million years ago. Lived in South Africa again. And some of the fossils that they found are outstandingly complete. Like some of the best we found of any hominin um, fossils. They had many developments uh, towards modern human characteristics, such as they had a short thumb and long fingers, um, which are signs of what we were saying earlier, the precision grip but they didn't have the palm that we have uh, their ankle joint was very similar to ours but their shin and heel were more chimp like um their pelvis was um sorry just read my notes here they had a larger pelvis than the other australopithecines which indicates that their brain um of their children would have been bigger because that's a correlation we've mm. seen but the cranial capacity was actually smaller than africanus it was just 450 mm. cc whereas Africanus was to go back to it I believe it was 485 yep 485 that's quite interesting because you would look at the development of like the human brain as if if it's is, is as if it's linear but that's not necessarily the case right it just no. depends on the pressures that are around but maybe other things happened as well so maybe they did like kind of develop a larger surface area so they didn't yeah. need the bigger volume anymore absolutely like that. yeah that could have been yeah. where the prefrontal cortex was coming into it yeah. i don't know whether or not they have evidence of when the prefrontal cortex was coming into it and surface area etc but i'm sure there are people much smarter than me which uh yeah. or much more educated at well, least that there would are know um different kind of like examples like i don't know the specifics but if you look back at just like homo sapiens there's different um like cultures and different groups of people who have different like head uh shapes mm. and stuff like that that suggest different things yeah so if you look at a lot of like ancient egyptians the back of their head was kind of like much larger and bigger than ours is now um so things like that might have to do with like bits of the brain that developed i don't know the specifics yeah. but yeah it's yeah, like they got, it's, it's interesting <laughs> definitely worth looking at the methodology of how they test for the mm. uh the the brain size or the cranium size yeah 
So we've got next a very famous one, which I may mispronounce. Correct me if I do. Uh, Homo habilis. That's what I was taught. I think it's right. I think that's right. Cool. That's what I've heard. So it was discovered by a team led by Lewis and Mary Leakey, big stars in anthropology, in 1960. It dates between 2.4 million years and 1.4 million years. Its name means handyman or skillful man in Latin. And it was believed to be the first human ancestor to, to deliberately create tools. Um, but we've this since, is really cool. It is fascinating. But we've since found earlier species that did as much. Um, what do you know? What do you know about uh, Habilis? Is there any cool facts you know, or um, not really? Actually, I mm. I was just gonna like ask some questions though about like you know there are some animals who use tools. Mm. So there are birds who sometimes use like um the needles from pine trees to like dig bugs out of trees, and there are otters who use rocks to smash open um like fruit or, or whatever it is and stuff like that. Um. Do we, like, this might sound stupid and this might not be a question for you, but, like, do we know when they evolved and if they were, like, before or at the same time as humans started using tools or is it something more recent? I see. So I don't I don't know, do you know when I mean? they evolved those techniques. Um, wouldn't surprise me if it was quite early, but, but the closest to the kind of tools, you, you, you hit on a good point. It's kind of like the definition of a tool. So when it came to um, Habilis and a few specimen before, they deliberately took rock and carved it into a spear. So, oh, okay. so that so this is, is like that's different. Creating tools yeah. rather than using tools. Yeah, exactly. Okay, got you. The, the, something that we've seen close with chimpanzees is that they will pick up a, um, a plant, they will remove all the leaves and sticks, etc., and then put it into a termite mound so that it gets covered in termites <laughs> and they'll bring it out and basically eat it. That's like, clever. Like an ice cream. Yeah, but is, is that, not... yeah like termite, termite ice cream, <laughs> but not ice <laughs> or cream. And not cream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just it's a termite stick. But that's yeah. very clever and that is technically creating a tool because they manipulated yeah. something in order to make it do something. But um, Is this something they've always done or that we've only just, like observed at the last well I, I guess we weren't observing for a long time were we this is the thing like we often yeah. think oh this animal is stupid and we forever keep finding out actually when you leave them to, to their own environment they are a lot mm -hmm. smarter than you expect they do a lot more things oh, yeah. than you would expect but it's just generally not an interest to us and there is this mm -hmm. human hubris where we do <laughs> like the idea that we are super important mm -hmm. super special and so we almost don't look for it um, it wouldn't surprise me that if there's many, many And then people like facts. Ken Han take that to the next level by being like, no, we're not animals, we're better than them. Exactly. It's like, don't teach <laughs> us that we're just animals. It's like, you don't, so you don't, you don't get it. Like, yeah, it's, it's really well, unfortunate. But um, it's, it's amazing as we study the animal kingdom, we'll see, you know, gorillas that, I think that the gorilla just passed away that was able to do yeah. sign language. Was it Coco? different sign language. Yeah, Coco, yeah. the gorilla. And... You know, you start seeing things where, you know, the, this gorilla is even able to kind of talk about memories from the past. And it was, you know, trying to recall a, a poaching incident that happened to its family. And, you know, you start seeing things that these abilities that we think are just innate to humans. And then we're seeing, to an alarming extent, intelligence in dolphins and elephants mm. and apes. And then we realize that we've we've lost a lot of our ancestors. We've lost a lot of these um these human like um species that probably were much much closer in intelligence to us you know yeah. we probably were able to actually have conversations with you know neanderthals and whatnot but well, i'm sure you're getting to to them yeah no i mean it's a great point you put on it's really sad it's one of the saddest facts about humanity for me um you you like to think we like to think i should say as a as a species that we're not racist but we are. We're fundamentally very racist. We spoke about this before. It's very easy without conditioning to look at somebody that's a different color than you and to suppose, to presume that they cannot experience pain like you, that they cannot have the same ambitions and happiness and extent well, of suffering. It was, just, it was like a survival mechanism, wasn't it? Yeah, it works. Like this it's immediate yeah. reaction to say, these people aren't part of my tribe. They could be dangerous. Mm. And to get you to like react straight away before you could even logically think it through yeah exactly and those those neural pathways are still in our brains whether we like it or not and it's just up to us to realize that no 
they're in there, but we have to overcome them if we want to be decent people. Yeah, yeah. Th- this is this is where you've got like common sense and our intuitions mm. versus logic and reason. And logic and reason is sh- yeah. showing us again and again that we are a predator and we're tribalistic. And we, if we care about compassion, we gotta fix these issues. They are really serious. Um, well, and I, like I'm sure, I'm sure we'll have an episode in the future where we kind of dive into the hard problem of consciousness. But when you look at chimp species and stuff a lot of times they they have a language and they have certain calls that they'll say you know for look out there's an eagle or look out there's a snake and they respond differently depending on on these calls yeah. and you know people uh, scientists can even recreate the calls record and then play them back and you know when they do the eagle call all the the apes or the chimps or whatever look up at the sky and you know scutter around whereas if there's the snake call then they all rush up into the tree and they'll even find um chimps that will will lie and they'll say look out an eagle and then the other chimps all run for the trees and then they'll go and they'll mm. steal the food you know so it's yeah. what what sets humans apart is that we've been able to take you know look out there's an eagle and just add certain layers of abstraction on top of it and add you know storytelling and metaphor and myths and things that aren't real and the, and stuff and so you're able to say you know, down by the river on the other side, you know, down south by whatever, there was this green such and such snake that's coming, mm-hmm. you know, comes out every time at this time o'clock, whatever. And so as you add these layers of complexity, all it is is, is you know, you're you're getting a larger brain, you're getting certain regions of your brain that are starting to form, but there's very gradual incrementations between this and we can can have very strong links between, you know, these regions of the brain and the functionality that they provide. And it's very demonstrable in nature. So to assume that there's no, you know, links between the two is is not just naive, it's utterly uneducated. Yeah, we, we look for the wrong thing as well. So, for example, we look at dogs and wolves and we, we're looking for some kind of auditory communication. Uh, there's a certain gene that we have that allows us to speak the way we do, something to do with the larynx. And it's found in chimps and it's found in humans. But it was that's it. That's all it's found in. And... We presume that they're going to communicate using the same methods that we do, but they don't. Mm. It turns out that walls communicate very coherently, but they do so by moving hairs on their back. Now, oh, wow. now that's only just come up, but it's just presumed they're stupid. They don't communicate. They're just a social species that somehow don't have a language. It's like, <laughs> think about what you're saying. There are social species. There's going to be some form of communication. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, it's definitely well, it's a point like to be jumped on. That- bees that will buzz in a particular pattern mm. to indicate where food is yeah insects are incredible because it comes down to like pheromones there's no brain yeah. essentially and yet they work as as a militant military unit that we can't ever replicate that kind of uniformity it's amazing well i don't know that i i bought some pheromone infused shampoo <laughs> everywhere i go the panties drop <laughs> brilliant so it always um surprises me as well how much other animals can pick up on like our communication kind of skills as well because with people sorry with people it's not just verbal but we communicate through our hand gestures through our facial features and things like that um and like seriously how kyra obviously my dog um can like express express herself to us like through her little like eyebrow movements and her facial movements like it it kind of leaves me in awe because i'm like yeah she can't like we don't have this same language but we can still kind of like communicate with each other on some level even if it's just a basic level of i want food give me cuddles okay sit (laughs) you know (laughs) but it's it's great i think no it is it's it's, i've always found that quite funny it's like the dogs can understand us very well we can't Mm. understand we can't understand dogs very well yet we're the smart one (laughs) (laughs) um But to just bring it back, um, Habilis had the same weight, height, and sexual dimorphism to previous finds, but it had a very big brain. So we, we're talking like 50% increase here. Their cranial capacity was 775. So in conjunction with, with our ancestors using tools, we see a massive increase in brain size. Isn't that a hypothesis? I don't know if this has been proven or disproven now. Mm-hmm. That that had something to do with the fact that we started cooking food and also eating cooking meat. Yeah, I've, I've, I was reading mm-hmm. the um, parts of that as well. The the mm-hmm. hypothesis there is that as soon as we learned to cook food, uh, cook meat, 
we were able to digest it a lot quicker and ha- we have more energy and the brain is an incredibly yeah. in- energy intense uh, organ to, to have it uses an enormous amount of your your energy i think it uses like 20 percent of your calories which considering yeah. its size yeah. is uh, it's a hell of is a lot. so much it's, a, it's an incredible mm-hmm. amount so yeah well, I, not, I, I not just with, with meats not just no. with meats but like there's there's a lot of um yeah different uh veg- vegetables and plants Ooh. and stuff that uh, yeah. we're true. not able to digest or break down so it just passes through us but there's yeah, like, when you aren't cook potatoes it it'll break poisonous down if we don't cook them perhaps um, perhaps i'm not sure but i i know that that a lot of nutrients when you break them down through heat then they become digestible and we're able to absorb more calories from it. and a lot of them you you kill the nutrients but you keep the calories and the calories are quite yeah. important considering it seems that we were driven out of africa because of a lack of food essentially and throughout africa as well but yeah there are theories on that but as Thomas was saying, it, it seems to be there's some that put it specifically on meat, uh, but there's many that just put it on the specifics of being able to consume more calories because you can break it down and mm-hmm. not have to make your way through all the fiber, which is, you know, you've probably heard that if you eat sal- celery, you essentially are burning as many calories as you are consuming. It's not, yeah. it's not an effective way to put on weight or to keep calories. It's a pretty good way to lose, to uh, stay in shape though. <laughs> um, so what I was going to say, um, they had disproportionately long arms compared to modern humans, but had less protruding faces than Australopithecines and much more human like faces and teeth. So the teeth is where the clues are coming in there as well. And um, their remains were often found with primitive stone tools, which is why it's got its why it got its name in the first place. So I've got a fun um, fun question for you before I move on to Erectus. <laughs> Between 200,000 and 300,000 years ago, how many subspecies of human do you think existed? Like, uh, convergently? Like, at the same time? Yep, they existed at the same time in different locations of the world, or in some cases, in the same location. Are we talking, like, tens or hundreds? <laughs> well, I'm thinking, like, 15. 15... 15 human species, you reckon, yeah? Okay, I'm going to go for five. Or subspecies. Is it because I went 15 as in, what the hell? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, initially I was thinking like eight, but I didn't know if that was like too high or too low. Eight would have been far too low. It's nine. Uh, (laughs) So yeah, (laughs) I wasn't that far off. You made it so I know I did. I know. It's a bit (laughs) cheeky there. But yeah, there was nine and um, that's a lot. That's a hell of a lot of species. And now there's one. I say species, subspecies is the best. Mm-hmm. So, um, looking at the time, I'll power through Homo erectus now. <laughs> There's something wrong about saying that. <laughs> so, so are you saying that we used to be more erectus than we are now? Oh no, we are more erect than erectus, but erectus was the first erect of all the non-erect apes. Of all the erect. <laughs> huh. no. So I'm so erect right now. <laughs> Uh, discovered by Eugene Dubios, I've got that wrong, but you know what, it's a name, live with it people, uh, in 1891, <laughs> dates between 1.9 million years and 143,000, making it one of the most successful oh. species so far. That's They existed when Homo sapiens existed, just to put that into perspective. That's an enormous That's amount of time they time. lived. Yeah, They lived in so Africa. So were they the first to stand upright? No, they weren't. Um, that, um, then why did they get the name? I'm not actually entirely sure. I should know that. It might be to do Weren't with the discovery. The first ones found? Yeah, it might be similar to Habilus. Like, yeah. yeah, Habilus is called Handyman, even though it's not the first person to use tools. It may be something similar to that. Or it may be the way in which we defined bipedalism at the time, or even today. But we do know that Lucy was walking upright. So okay. Lucy is where it's really starting. Um, well, wasn't, wasn't Lucy like sometimes walking upright, but not 100% of the time? Yeah. So, like, you could see in her structure that kind of intermediate. that in between state state. I, I guess thinking okay. about it and with the questions you're asking, I guess erectus would mean that um, there's very few traits left for arboreal locomotion, and so they are bipedal for all intents and purposes. Um, but yeah, good question. Uh, they lived in Africa and Western Asia, making them the first human to leave Africa, Ooh. which is that's big. Their so height they started spreading out. Yeah, exactly. Their height was um, four foot nine to six foot one, mm-hmm. so very tall. Oh, so getting more our height. Really tall, yeah, really, really tall. It's basically our height. Uh, they weighed up to seventy kilo, 
that's uh, re- relatively heavy, but for six six foot, it's not that heavy at all. Um, it makes them a lot so he- heavier than me. <laughs> yeah, if you were six foot one, oof, you'd you surely be going towards that seventy. <laughs> I was going to guess your weight then. That would have been terrible. Um, Go on, have a guess. <laughs> uh, 54 kilo. I don't I, I know don't... what that is in pounds. All right, let me Google it. I'll give it to everyone. Okay. That's 2.2. That's what, 115 pounds? 54 kilo. Do you want it in um, stone or do you want it in pounds? What do we want? Well, I, I weigh myself in pounds All right. normally. All right, we're going to go for pounds. It's a, we're go pounds. It's a good measure. Uh, 120 pounds. How tall do you think i am five foot four? Oh, okay i'm really offended now <laughs> i can't remember <laughs> <laughs> oh god okay i'm gonna um, say a hundred and uh five that's very tall <laughs> <laughs> yes i'm 105 feet and <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um no i'm like i'm about five six and ah. about i fluctuate between like 95 and 100 pounds Whoa, that's yeah. Wow, that's much lighter than I thought. Um, yeah. move, move, um, moving on. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you added twenty pounds yeah. and knocked off a couple of inches. Well, I based I based it Thanks, I Steve. based it on my girl I based it on my girlfriend. You know, my girlfriend's um, about five five, and she uh, she weighs sixty kilo and like she's thin. So I thought, well, you can't. <laughs> she you probably, can't probably is very out. thrilled with you Just broadcasting your weight. Wearing, like, we met. <laughs> to like, the world. You need to throw it out. <laughs> <laughs> it was clearly unflattering. <laughs> guys, guys, you're taking the conversation away from where it should be. I shall uh, take us back. <laughs> hi, hi, Steve's girlfriend, who's now mad at him. <laughs> no, my girlfriend he, is absolutely beautiful. It must be all muscle. That's what I say. Muscle and boot. While, while you're listening to this, he's on his way to buy you flowers and say he's sorry for... <laughs> I am. It's, you're not wrong. Telling flowers the and world. not chocolates? Is there a reason you don't want to buy a chocolate, Steve? Yeah, she should get fat. So... Move it. <laughs> <laughs> right. They had an early cranial capacity of 850 cc and a late of 1,100. That's huge. Huh. 1,100. That's a big difference a as well. Big brain. Yeah, they developed. I mean, it is it is over a big period. You know, from two million years to basically 150,000. But that's a big increase in brain size. They had similar limbs. Can I ask a stupid question? Always. Thank you. Um. So if if we like, if they lived over such a long period of time, and we see difference in differences in them from like the old ones to the new ones, how exactly do we know that they were the same species and that they could um, uh, like reproduce? Was it just everything else stayed the same, or? Uh, it's a good question. So, so well, f- yeah, go on. Don't we have? Don't we have genetic traits or genes and stuff that we'll see, like uh, shared certain shared genes and stuff that can help us determine that? Evidently, we don't of of erectus, so far as my research took me. But that might might not be true. And all of the subsequent ones I've mentioned, I don't think we have any DNA evidence of. But we do of the ones that follow. Um, but really, it's to do with when when you find several hundred individuals and they look exactly mm. the same, and it's a very specific look, and the bones yeah. are in the right way, and the cranial capacity is the same. You can infer that it's very likely that they um, are the same species. But you're right; we oh. ultimately don't quite know, and we've made mistakes when it comes to dinosaurs, where we've said, "Oh, this is a new species," when really it's a child of a bigger dinosaur that we already know it's just the- can i make one other distinction oh, okay say again um can i make one other distinction mm-hmm. um sometimes like when when you have speciation like there you, oftentimes it occurs when there's some type of isolation of groups where they're, they'll split off in different directions mm-hmm. and so they're far enough away from each other but oftentimes there's kind of a gradient where you might still be able to reproduce so that you know, we found certain Neanderthal genes in modern humans that indicate that we we were able to reproduce with Neanderthals, but oftentimes, like the more different two species get, there's like a, a stronger revulsion where you're like you you're less likely to or less likely to want to reproduce mm. with them. Yeah, and then if you get far enough away, then it becomes genetically impossible to yeah. reproduce. And do, sometimes do you-, you can have like animals like a mule where it's you know 
it can't reproduce with other mules, but it's like two different species can reproduce to make one. Here's one for you. Do you know if we can have we can successfully reproduce with chimps? No. No. We can't. We can't. So we've tried. No. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If I'm sure to do someone it sexually, has, but I think someone's but, tried to do it like in vitro. But have they really? Like, is that possible? I imagine I'm, so. I'm curious. We probably can't. You're probably right. But I'm just, I'm just curious about oh, how you far. Know that, you know, there's probably someone living in the jungle who's tried it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe there is a new uh humanoid species that's uh occurred from it uh probably not i was just curious whether or not we knew that answer to a very disturbing question <laughs> um homo erectus was the first that we have of um a hominid looking after its weak we can tell that because loads of bones we found have fixed after being broken in states where they, could not, they it's just not possible that they would have been able to survive on their own. So they were definitely tribalistic. That's a big move is, forward. Is this around the time they start performing like brain surgeries as well by like drilling the holes in the brains? Or was that Ooh. even earlier than this? I think I think it's later. much later. I think I think uh, trepidation oh, was, was yeah. like 15,000 years ago uh, as evidenced oh, by okay. skulls. Because I was going to say, I know it's like a long time ago, but... Mm. No, I don't think it was anywhere near that long ago. They probably still oh, thought okay, that. I don't know what they would have thought. I've got no idea. <laughs> but then we've got Homo, Homo heidelbergensis. I hope I said that right. <laughs> Discovered by a German workman, just an average workman, in 1908. It dates between 700 and 200,000 years ago. It's represented by 28 individuals. They are. I an- love these stories of regular people making I, like huge I love discoveries. It. It's like that eight-year-old that just discovered one in yeah. 2008. A very, very important so find. It's fantastic. It just makes me happy. Mm, for sure. Um, they are. It, I, I should say it does mean that there's other people which are like dedicated their lives to this. Going, oh, for <laughs> fuck's sake. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, they, these guys are ancestral to Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis. And we know this because we actually have their DNA. Now, this is Ooh. the first where we've managed to get some DNA, which is fantastic. Um, I d- How did I, we do it? I'm not entirely sure. I wish I could answer okay. that question. If I had more time, I would have figured that one out because that was one of my questions. Okay. Um, I'll try and remember it for an, a future mm-hmm. episode to bring it up. But um, evidently, we do have DNA of them, and that's one of the reasons we know that they are ancestral to both us and Neanderthalensis. They yes. stood at five foot nine. They only weighed sixty kilo, which is very light. Um, uh, scientists currently believe this was an adaptation to conserve heat, as they lived in colder climates, so there's less surface area. They controlled fire, used wooden spears, and they were the first human species to ru- routinely hunt large animals. So we've got good evidence Ooh. of them hunting on purpose with wooden spears animals so fascinating species and they're the first to create simple dwellings out of rock and wood like deliberately manipulate these things to make a shelter so far as we know this is there could have been further their cranium size so yeah oh sorry no, I was just say, would they also have been one of the first species to have kind of like set gender roles then if they had like homes and hunting parties I personally suspect gender roles have existed. Um, in fact, we know really that they existed way before um, humanoids were about at all. Mm. Because you can just look at our great humanoids, apes. Humanoids. Uh, I'm assuming you meant Homo sapiens. Homo. Um, I mean humans in general, or Homo Day, or whatever term they may use. Because if you look I've, at chimps and some... gorillas, they have sexual roles. Uh, almost all mammals do as well. There is. That's true. It's already. I've, in... I've read some stuff about how some of the kind of like early human-ish type species um the women would still go out hunting even when they had their young and even when they were like kind of pregnant yeah. because they were kind of like stronger and the young were more resilient but as our babies started being born like earlier and earlier and they were like more and more helpless when they were born um they needed more looking after so the women were like well better stay at home with this instead of risking its life they may they may have used slaves as well so if you look at viking culture um viking culture women could do what they want they could lead clans they could go conquer they could do whatever they want they just got slaves to look after their children um certainly with certain epochs so i think it's largely a cultural thing it's like there's different ways to answer that question but then there is definitely something to do with females being the more um maternal uh of of the two genders or two biological sexes i I I should say i think it started like less as a kind of like 
well, I guess kind of a maternal thing, but also like, um, this is just going on some stuff I read like a few months back now, so it's like not fresh in my mind, but I read something about how like originally the babies were born kind of like later and they were like more sort of self-sufficient and the mother was like childbirth wasn't quite as difficult and stuff like that, whereas um, as the babies were kind of like born earlier, but also their heads were bigger, it was more traumatic for the mother um, and the baby needed kind of like more looking after um so it kind of became a sort of more um both women and babies were more vulnerable straight after birth and then obviously like when they start to bond and things like that then i guess your maternal instincts kick in a bit more but yeah i don't know that's a good point you raised there, there's probably a co-evolution <clears throat> with bigger mm. brains because it means that we have to yeah. get the babies out sooner um yeah yeah and, that was the thing yeah. yeah exactly and um women being more caregiving i think i think you're probably right there's going to be there probably is an ample evidence of that that evolution it definitely makes sense because we give birth way too young way too young um you look at whales like their gestation is years years and years <laughs> but also our babies as well like they're they're useless when they're born like oh yeah you ever seen a baby giraffe being born literally they yeah, drop cool. five feet they're huge and then they're up on their feet and walking and they can go off and do whatever giraffes don't have gender roles because their babies are self-sufficient yeah you know? yeah exactly. when babies are born very prematurely mm. it, yeah. well that's it this is why we're so yeah. useless it's not it, that's I, a necessity I part, right i think part of that mm -hmm. is that as as women's um hips became like smaller and human baby heads got bigger then mm. like if if you had babies that were born 12 months in that got way bigger well there's probably going to be a lot more damage and a lot higher fatality rates mm. um the, from, the hips know. of mm -hmm. women got bigger like these bones show it as well the, the hips get bigger as well because it was well, but they're trying to also be because they're a form of looking after of of being because we stand upright though it's it's a much more difficult childbirthing process than for for yeah. apes yeah it is yeah there, so, were, there were basically like lots of different things going on down there so and basically childbirth today just is not ideal at no, it's, all it's a really like an intelligent designer is a maniac if they designed it this way <laughs> oh god um mm. the cranium size of these wonderful individuals uh homo heidelbergensis is 1250 cc which is 10 cc off homo sapiens so what this means is that 700,000 years ago, there was a species of human or subspecies of human that had a brain as big as us. Now, that begs the question, or it gets us to ask the question, ha have we stopped evolving bigger brains? Well, maybe they're just becoming more complex. Maybe, yeah, because we, as you we know. said earlier, big doesn't necessarily mean better Yeah. in this context. Well, a lot <laughs> of the, the regions of our brains have... have heavily specialized in certain mm -hmm. functions yes. exactly and i think our, our brains too have more surface area now than they used to yeah so i mean there, there's a lot of different things that um just just because maybe the overall size the overall volume might have been the same or larger mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily mean that the intelligence levels were the same yeah depending on how you want to measure that yeah the arbitrary measure you want to use well and like, you know cranium about it. i was just gonna say cranium size isn't arbitrary but i do get mm. what you're saying well no i'm saying like it's it's a little arbitrary what you decide to measure based off of is, is it like you know intelligence is the ability oh, to uh, you know to, I, to, iq to, for you, example you could, you could say that that someone who can you know instantly stare at a bunch of sticks on the ground and tell you that there's 5,842 of them. You could say, oh, they're way more intelligent, but they may lack yeah. all social abilities whatsoever yep, absolutely, um, to, yeah. to function in society. So yeah. it's your your choice of, of what is intelligence really depends on what the, the end goal is. Because for that person, if the end goal is counting sticks, then damn, they're way at the top <laughs> of the, the food chain. Yeah, no, you're, you're completely with you there. There's, there's many ways to define it and you should you know, it, it's almost an impossible question, which is a problem with the IQ test, to be honest with you. It's not really testing for retention of knowledge, etc. There's many things to it. But I want to move on, and I want to move on to my favourite human species, and that is Homo neanderthalensis. 
discovered mm-hmm. in 1829 in the Neander Valley in Germany, which is where they get their name from, dates between 400,000 and 40,000 years ago, represented by over 400 fossils, lived in Europe and East Asia. Males were 5'5 five, five on average and weighed 77 kilo, which, if you think about it, that's really heavy for, for that height. And females were 5'1 and weighed 66 kilo compared to, yeah, so compared to Homo sapiens, they had thicker limbs, uh, conical rib cage, thicker hand bones, wider pelvis, likely to accommodate a larger brain, shorter shins, larger skulls, angled foreheads, projection of the nose, no chin, angled cheekbones, and of course, a thick brow ridge. Their cranial capacity, this fascinates me, was 1,600 on average. That's a lot bigger than ours. That that's that's that is huge. But again, what does that mean? We've we've been through this. They interbred with Homo sapiens, as as uh, you were referring to earlier on, Thomas. So if you're from European descent, there's a chance that you have up to five percent of your DNA being from Neanderthalensis. Um, here's something that's interesting. I did a I brought this up before on the podcast. I did a test for Twenty Three and Me where they took my DNA and they tried to figure out among other things, whether or not I've got Homo um, neanderthalensis DNA. And put it this way, the most they've ever had with a customer is 400 gene variants. How many do you think I had? 390. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) I had 300. 300 variants, which is a lot. Um, I was close. Yeah, you was. You were bang on. You you were near. Um, It's like... (laughs) 70 or 60 70 percent more than most most people that they've tested um and it was fascinating the gene variants that i have one is for a lack of hair on my back which might sound really oddly specific but that's just the way it rolls um a useful one though it is like i have hairy backs exactly and useful for neanderthal because of their location you save a lot on waxing i do well it's weird i got hair which goes from my waist down and then i've got it on my beard um, if you call it a beard, some would just call it butt fluff. And then I've got it on my uh, on my head, my scalp. But I just, other than armpits, I just don't grow it anywhere. And I've got a feeling that's probably got something to do with that gene variant now. And there was other things. I don't sneeze when I eat chocolate. Um, one of the reasons is because I have that variant from Neanderthals. <laughs> and there was there was just several other variants that I had. It's, it's fascinating to look up. I highly recommend how common it. Is, how common is it that people sneeze when they eat chocolate? I don't know, to be honest with you, but is it's that a bit actually like, a thing? Yeah, no, it absolutely is a thing. Yeah. H- here's one that There's I've people got. People who sneeze when they see the sun, yeah, don't I, they? Yeah, I do. I've got that. If I if really? I, if I want to sneeze, um, I will look up at the sun, and I will sneeze most of the time when I want to. It's it's a really weird experience, but yeah. Um, Kyra has a thing where she sneezes every time she leaves the flat. Like, just outside our front door, like, into mm. the shared corridor. It's prob- so I'm wondering if she's, like, allergic to some kind of cleaning product they use. Nah. It's really cute. She, like, she'll, like, go out. She'll be running down the corridor. And she'll just stop in the tracks and just let out, like, one or two little sneezes. It's really cute. Aww. Sorry, I'm sharing. No, that's cool. <laughs> I was just, just thinking that you should keep her in the dark and then let her out into the light and see if she sneezes. <laughs> you can see if she's got the uh, that gene. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the last one I want to end on is um, Homo... I can't ever get this right. Floor essenensis. Nah, that I just butchered. Homo use your, floor. Use your web page thingy. Oh, no, nah, it'll take too long. We'll just say okay. homo floor. We'll just keep it like that. <laughs> I'll put a link in the description. But they were discovered in 2003. They date between 700 and 50,000 years ago. And they were only three foot five in height, which is why they've been Hobbit nicknamed man. the Hobbit. Exactly. Hobbits. They had comparatively very big feet. And they <gasps> use tools. Hobbits. Yeah. Hobbits. Hobbits were real. <laughs> Did they have hairy feet? Don't know so far as that, but yeah, uh-huh. they have big feet. Very big feet. For the size. Yeah. So there you go. That is that is a brief introduction to some of the amazing finds that scientists and anthropologists and paleontologists, etc., have found so far. Um, there's so much more that I could have delved into, but we're already at an hour and a half uh, or approaching. So, I'm happy we just to. Too much. Well, well, no, it was a good conversation. I, uh, I, I, I enjoyed myself. That's what matters. I don't mm-hmm. care if anyone else did. <laughs> 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 um, so yeah. On that note, next week we have Thomas. What are we going to be talking about, Thomas? 
I don't remember. <laughs> no, I'm I'm talking about memory <laughs> and how our how our memories are formed on. and how we can improve ours. You're pretty That's happy with that, aren't very you? Very fun, interesting. You're uh, yeah. yeah, you're pretty happy with that. You're going to celebrate, Steve. Great, great job on this episode. <laughs> I I was very erectus throughout the entire thing. <laughs> You two oh. are such a bunch of homos. Yeah. <laughs> Where, uh, that's. I can't beat that. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> this has been an absolute blast. And now we want you to join in the conversation over on the Here and Now Facebook and Twitter pages. Or follow us on Pinterest and Instagram if you just want some of the dankest of sciencey memes. If you like one of our particular styles, check out each of our YouTube channels Rachel Oates, Rationality Rules by Stephen Woodford, and Holy Kool Aid by me, Thomas Westbrook. To find all of our episodes, show notes, contact information, and more, warp on over to our home base, thehereandhow.com. If you enjoyed this episode and want us to succeed in spreading the love of science, you can help us out by giving us a five-star review on iTunes or Stitcher. And to all our friends and family listening, thank you for spending this episode with us. We'll be back to explore another exciting big idea next week. Now go create something magnificent. <laughs>